to World War II, Part 2. And somehow in the process of cutting and pasting things over, I lost the blue background and changed the font. But that's great, because now the little words, wait a minute, they're on this side, the words that were covered over in the previous video are now there, so you can write them down. So, worked out handy. Anyway, I had been talking about the Washington Naval Conference and the Washington Naval Treaty. There were actually a few of them, but they all came out of this disarmament movement in the 1920s, uh, trying to solve the problem of the international war by restricting the use of, of not the use, but the build-up of, of weapons. Okay. If you build weapons, people want to use them. Now that was uh, 21, 22, 23. Here's a better idea. Let's just outlaw war. So in 1928, this is something else that's not on the outline here, you get the kellogg briand Pact in 1928. See, this is the equivalent of me writing on the dry erase board. Okay? 1928, the kellogg briand Pact. Now, Kellogg was the Secretary of State for the United States. Briand was from France. And they worked out this deal, and then other countries signed on and I'll simplify it greatly. It's more complicated. It's basically it outlaws war as a means of settling disputes. Solves the problem, doesn't it? War is now illegal. I don't know if this is in the book. Right? Uh, you can look it up on uh, on the that thing called the internet. Uh, it might be in the book. It wasn't in the index. In some ways, it's not particularly important. I'm just trying to explain to you uh, how. After World War I, there was you know, various diplomatic movements afoot to try to solve the problems that led to the Great War. So we've got the League of Nations working, although the United States is not in it. Uh, the United States is leading the way on naval disarmament and on the, uh, you know, the idea of trying to basically outlaw aggression as a means of settling international disputes. So uh, there's lots of people thinking about how did that war happen and what can we do to stop the next one. And that was all in the 1920s, so we're not even to the outline yet, which says, if you look up at the top there, uh, the world to World War, oh, sorry, the road to World War II, 1931 to 1941. So let's get on to 1931, shall we? Next slide. So, one of the two paths towards World War II starts in Asia. Okay. Japanese expansion in the Far East. Let me see if I get some artwork here. Here we go. So, uh, get my marker. Here is Japan. Right. It's an island. It's an archipelago out in the Pacific, although it's very, very close to mainland Asia. <coughs> now, I don't know a lot about Japanese history, but I probably know more than you because I actually took a class in Japanese history. Oh yes, they won't let you be a history major and only take American history classes. Oh, if only that were the case. But we do have to take a few other things as well. And I took a class in Japanese history. It was really, really interesting. Now, I only took that one class, so it's three hours. It's not like I have a brain full of Japanese history, but I probably know more than any of you. Uh, so let me give you a quick, quick miniature uh, catch-up here. Japan had led an isolated existence for a few centuries. Now, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so don't ask me for exact, you know, dates and stuff. Uh, at one time, Japan interacted with the world. Yeah. They had some various run-ins with you know, other countries that they weren't totally happy about. And so at some point, Japanese decided, you know what, let's just close the door and not interact with the rest of the world. Okay? And so Japan becomes this isolated, you know, country. Okay? You don't leave Japan, and you don't come visit Japan. It's just the Japanese living on the islands. Okay? Now... They, they did very little interaction with the world. There was, oddly enough, and for reasons I won't go into because it's Japanese history, but 
uh, the Dutch. The Japanese had a trading relationship with the Dutch. Uh, the Dutch would send a limited number of uh, trade ships in each year. I think they only came in like once a year, or maybe a couple of times. But anyway, uh, they would land in Nagasaki Harbor. They weren't even allowed on the mainland. They would unload goods. Uh, they would pick up goods from Japan. And so there was a very limited amount of trade uh, interaction between Japan and the rest of the world. And what they did get was all through the Dutch. Uh, if you left Japan, you weren't allowed to come back in. Okay. So they were an isolated, closed, homogenous society, and they liked it that way. Okay, okay so <clears throat> for about two and a half centuries, the Japanese were a closed society with very limited interaction with the world. Then in the 1850s, the United States came knocking on the door. Uh, we won't bother to go into all this. It, it should be covered in the 1301 class, but we never do because there's just not enough time. But uh, the Americans are looking you know, to expand out of the Pacific to get trade going, and so we go to visit Japan. A guy by the name of uh, Commodore uh, Matthew Perry. This was, this was before he was involved in the Friends TV show. But Commodore Matt Perry uh, goes to Japan to visit. Uh, the Japanese are like, hi, thank you very much, no soliciting, uh, you know, so there's no doorbell, uh, no, no visitors welcome. And Perry's kind of like, well, I'll just get back on my warships here, you know, the things with all the cannons on them. Uh, we'll leave for a while. We'll come back in a week or two, or not sure the exact dates elude me, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back in a short period of time with our warships, and we'll see if uh, you want to discuss this. And so the Japanese decide, well, maybe we should talk with the Americans. Um, and so they kind of open up a little bit, and we start interacting with them. And pretty soon, Japan is no longer a closed society. Now, here's what happens. During their two and a half centuries of isolation, they have fallen behind technologically. Uh, Japan is very much still like a feudal society uh, run by you know, warlords. Uh, you know, we still have you know, samurai soldiers, which are like more like knights. It's almost like they're stuck in where Europe had been uh, a couple hundred years earlier. So the Japanese look out and say, "Gosh, we we've, we've fallen behind the times," and they kind of go. The nation kind of goes on a massive like catch-up program. They start uh, becoming industrialized. They start expanding outward, and in a matter of just like 50 years. Uh, they've done a real good job of catching up with, with the rest of the world okay, as far as being a modern industrial type power. Now, one of the things they look at is that all the world powers, Great Britain, France, uh, Germany, had a limited number of colonies, the U.S. has the Philippines, all the world powers have overseas possessions, they have colonies. Okay? And Japan looks and says, well, you know, if we want to be a world power, that's what we need to be. Yeah. That's what we need to do, too. Of course, the Japanese have this strong uh, military tradition, and so they start looking to expand. Yeah. Uh, the logical place to go if you're you know, in Japan... Now, remember, Japan is a series of islands that have very limited natural resources. Okay? Uh, they'd like to get some resources, and they look... China seems like a logical place to go. It's right across... Uh, you know, over here. Uh, so I think there was some kind of incident with China in the late 1800s, if I recall. Uh, but in the early 1900s, okay, the Japanese would go to war with Russia. See here it says USSR. USSR wasn't around at the time I'm talking about. It was still Russia. But the Japanese go to war against Russia, and a lot of people's surprise, they defeat the Russians. Now, to the, to the Westerners, this is kind of shocking because Russia is considered a European power. Now, they're the, like one of the weaker of the military, U.S. So they're one of the weaker of the European powers. They're not quite as advanced industrially as, say, you know, England. But they're still considered kind of westernized. And then they're kind of shocked when they're defeated by the Japanese in this uh, war, which took place... Uh, during Theodore Roosevelt's administration. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt 
won the Nobel Peace Prize for helping to negotiate, you know, some kind of settlement here. Yeah. So the Japanese are starting to kind of get out and flex their muscle a little bit. Okay. Right about 1910 or so, uh, they move here into Korea. See, it says Japanese territory as of 1928 down here. You notice the dark area is Korea. Okay, so Korea is a different area. I mean, the Koreans are ethnically different than the Japanese. They're both Asians. But Korea is, because they're attached to China, has a lot of different cultures and things. And one day the Japanese just kind of waltz in and kind of gobble up Korea. I don't know any of the particulars about that. I did have a student in my class once who was of Korean background, and, and uh, that student knew some of the uh, background. It was, but I didn't have time to get into it. Because, you know, it's a U.S. history survey class. Uh, and so the point I'm making here is that Japan, with a kind of a military tradition, and seeing that the rest of the world is getting involved in uh, colonization, wants to expand too. Now, the Japanese were involved in World War I, very small amount, because remember, most of World War I is going on over in France. But the Germans did have some holdings in China, They're like a city. Excuse me. Okay, the hiccups have stopped. Let's try this again. Uh, during World War I, the Japanese were involved to a small degree. Uh, they basically went after the German holdings in the China, area around China. Uh, there were a few battles, or at least one. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's a real, real small portion of World War I. But it does put Japan on the side of the Allies uh, and puts them on the winning side. And they come out of the war uh, you know, with some of the German holdings turned over to them. So this all happens before 1931. Okay, so I'm kind of caught up with what's going on. Yeah. So in 1931, the Japanese told you they'd like to you know, expand. They move into the area here of Manchuria. Okay. This highlighter thing is really cool. Okay. Yeah. Which makes sense, because remember, the Japanese are already in Korea, so it's not too hard to move into Manchuria. Now, remember back when I talked about the Boxer Rebellion, that China was a very weak government at this time. They've, uh, you know, not a good, solid, you know, government uh, control. And so Japanese just kind of waltz in. Uh, I mean, there's the threat of military force, but from what I understand, this was not a heavy military action. Uh, you can see here where it says Japanese troops entering uh, during this incident. So there's like a manufactured incident. The Japanese ar army moves in. And the Japanese kind of gobble up this part of Manchuria. They set up a puppet government called uh, Manchuko. And I'm probably mispronouncing that since I don't speak Chinese or Japanese. Uh, uh, and so the Chinese, I'm sorry, the Japanese have gobbled up a little piece of China. Okay. U.S. reaction. Does this go against American foreign policy? Yeah, remember uh, John Hay and the open door policy? And he also said that everyone should respect the territorial integrity of China. Japan is not respecting the uh, inter territorial integrity of China. China can complain to, complain to the League of Nations, but there's nothing really the League of Nations can do except fire up a typewriter, send nasty notes to the Japanese. Uh, they don't really have the military power to stop this. Could the Americans get involved? I mean, we said we don't want people, you know, invading China and taking their territory. But, I mean, this is 1931. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. Okay? What? Herbert Hoover's going to go to Congress, ask for a declaration of war to protect China from Japan. Do you think anybody's going to go for that? No. So the Japanese get away with this. Okay? People aren't happy about it, but nothing really comes of it. U.S. reaction is basically diplomatic protest, nasty notes, but there's really nothing we can do. It's on the other side of the planet, and there's really probably not a lot we could have done about it. Uh, end of part two.